Hello and welcome into the Big Ten Blitz presented by The Floor Slap. I'm your host, Sean. In case you're new to us, The Floor Slap is a Big Ten sports blog run by my buddy Jordan and myself. You can catch us on Twitter or X at The Floor Slap. We also have a website, thefloorslap.com. And this is our brand new college football podcast, The Big Ten Blitz, episode two. And we have a really great episode ahead of ourselves today. First and foremost, going to give my reaction to Jim Harbaugh leaving Michigan, going to the Chargers, and then hiring Sharon Moore in his place. Going to give my full breakdown and really my outlook for that program over the next three to five years with Sharon Moore. Then we're going to get into another edition of uh, college football playoff predictions. Going to give my updated bracket because, believe it or not, a lot has changed over the landscape in college football since our last episode a few weeks ago. So I think this one is a much more accurate prediction of um, how the college football landscape is going to look like in 2024. And then to end today's episode, going to introduce a new segment, Big Ten Heat Check. Essentially, a few hot takes, bold predictions for the 2024 season. And we have some heaters today, uh, thus the name, but won't waste any more time here. Going to jump right into it. So to kick things off today, I feel like I have to address what's going on with Michigan with Jim Harbaugh finally bolting for Los Angeles to join the Chargers after years of flirting with the NFL and Michigan then hiring Sharon Moore to be their full-time head coach. Uh, Before I dive into what's going on at Michigan, I want to address exactly why Jim Harbaugh decided to leave Michigan and finally go to the NFL because I've seen a lot of people talking about, you know, it was the state of college football and NIL is the reason that pushed Jim Harbaugh out of the college game. Also, people say it was because of the mass exodus of talent it's leaving Michigan. You know, they're famously graduating 40, 50 guys from a loaded 2023 roster. Um, people have said that it's this mass exodus of talent that Jim Harbaugh wants to get out of Michigan before they have a down season. And I've people heard people say it's because of the looming NCAA investigation. And the fact of the matter is that none of those are the reason that Jim Harbaugh left Michigan and went to the NFL. I mean, first of all, with the NIL stuff, believe it or not, Michigan's actually had a lot of success in the portal over the past couple seasons under Jim Harbaugh. I mean, just in the past two seasons alone, they've brought in three all Big Ten offensive linemen. They brought in Josiah Stewart last year, who's going to be their top returning pass rusher entering 2024, and A.J. Barner, who was their key blocking tight end this past year. He was a transfer addition. So Jim Harbaugh has adapted and he has been active in the transfer portal. And then on the recruiting side of things, things haven't changed that much for Michigan over the past couple of years. I mean, they've always been a program that have thrived on bringing in three-star guys that fit their culture and developing them um, over the course of years rather than relying on blue-chip four- and five-star recruits to come in and be immediate impacts and be ready to play in year one or two. That hasn't been their MO, and it hasn't changed with the transfer portal. And, you know, they have been able to bring in under Harbaugh a few of those blue chip guys. I mean, J.J. McCarthy, probably the first one that comes to mind, because remember, he was a five star quarterback. He was uh, one of the top 100 players in his recruiting class. But that hasn't been a cornerstone of Michigan's success over this three year run is, uh, you know, they've really ramped up recruiting and now they're not going to be able to with NIL. That hasn't been the case at all. Uh, The fact of the matter is Jim Harbaugh has proved that he's been willing and able to adjust his roster management style to fit with the current times. So, I mean, the NIL and transfer portal and roster management as a whole has zero to do with him taking the job in the NFL. And he's also not scared of falling off and having a down year with Michigan, um, despite their recent standards, you know, with them now winning a national championship. Because believe it or not, before this three years stretch we're in right now for Michigan, Jim Harbaugh had really, really good teams there in 2016 and in 2018. And then after each of those years, Michigan kind of took a step back and failed to reach 10 wins. So he's already used to kind of the ebbs and flows of running the team like he does. I mean, developing talent and having most starters around for three or more years and having a lot of guys return for a couple years and then having one year where you lose double digit starters. You know, he's and naturally with that you're, is, is going to come a down year. He's used to the ebbs and flows of managing the roster the way he has been. So it's not like the talent level of Michigan next season is going to plummet them to a 6-6 six and six season 
they are looking at an 8, 9, 10 win season next year. And I don't think Harbaugh, by any means, was scared of going 9 and 3 again. That's certainly on the table. And then there's the looming NCAA investigation. That's certainly a big deal for the future of Michigan football and Sharon Moore's ability to sustain the kind of success that Jim Harbaugh has had at Michigan. But this investigation did not prompt Jim Harbaugh to go snooping around for other jobs and not prompt him to be like, oh, you know, I should be looking at the NFL. It's, you know, it's not like if this investigation never even started that Jim Harbaugh would definitely be back in Michigan right now. Because the fact of the matter is he has always wanted to go back to the NFL ever since he was fired by the 49ers almost 10 years ago. I mean, back in 2021, after they beat Ohio State for the first time, he was on the verge of taking the Vikings job. I think he assumed he was going to get the offer. And then it got, ended up getting taken out from underneath him and he returned to Michigan. But he would have left if he had received that author, uh, offer. Last offseason, the Broncos were between Jim Harbaugh and Sean Payton. If they went with Harbaugh over Peyton, Harbaugh would have left despite that one more year campaign that Michigan had last year. Uh, he could have left each of the past two seasons and he would have had no problem leaving without being a national champion at the college level. And he would have been okay with that because chasing a Super Bowl is his ultimate goal. It always has been, always will be, and I don't think he will stop coaching until he finally reaches that Super Bowl. So as much as Jim Harbaugh loved Michigan, you know, I, I don't think anyone's arguing he's a, a Michigan man. But he wants, he likes the NFL more and he wants to win a Super Bowl more than he loves Michigan. And that's the fact. And that's why he left, not because of any of those reasons. Moving on from there, though, I, Michigan made the obvious choice, elevated Sharon Moore from offensive coordinator to become their new head coach. And yes, I do agree that it is largely the obvious choice for Michigan to make, considering how he handled Jim Harbaugh's suspension at the end of the season, handling those three game days and how highly the, spe the players speak of him, both the players that are going to the NFL and graduating and the players that are returning back next year, it was clear from the get-go. They were all very vocal that they wanted Sharon Moore to be hired as head coach. So I totally get it. It would have been really difficult for Michigan to bring in someone else after the momentum that Sharon Moore had going for him. But considering that Michigan didn't even contemplate looking at other coaches, they didn't even consider an interview, they didn't even you know, make some calls to see what kind of big names would be maybe interested in, in looking into a program like Michigan, considering that was never even on the table. This seems to me the move of hiring Sharon Moore as full-time head coach, more of a decision to preserve some short-term success at Michigan rather than really setting up this program to be a power five, you know, three, five, ten years from now. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Michigan is already, as I've said before, losing 40-plus players to graduation. They are the, one of the most experienced senior-laden teams in the history of college football last year. So naturally, we knew coming into last year that, you know, coming into 2024, they were going to be losing a lot of players. And I talked about it on my last episode. They have lost some players that they, I think a lot of Michigan fans were kind of hoping would stick around and help this transition period a little bit more. But they are pretty bare bones. They are going into 2024 with single-digit starters. and if they did not hire Sharon Moore as their full-time head coach, if they went with an outside hire that didn't have a direct relationship with this Michigan team and the coaching staff from the past few years, chances are Michigan would have lost a really good chunk of their 2024 recruiting class, and they'd be more heavily impacted by transfers out of the program. Because, uh, you know, we're a couple of weeks removed away from that 30-day transfer portal opening for Michigan. And no projected 2024 starters have hit the portal yet. No guys that are expected to have a really significant impact next season have left. And that's great, great news for them. If they had not hired Sean Moore, I guarantee a lot more people would have either jumped to the NFL or gone to the transfer portal. And, you know, so if they had brought in an outside hire outs other than Sean Moore to be their head coach, you know, they were setting them up for a, a tall task in 2024 because they'd probably be looking at three or four returning starters across you know every position group so it really would be like you're starting from scratch if a new coach came in to coach Michigan and with the more higher they retain a lot of talent on that defense and that alone should be good enough to keep them in the playoff conversation next year but what I have a problem with I mean I have serious concerns about Sharon Moore's ability to keep the momentum going at Michigan beyond 2024 and honestly, this hire reminds me a lot of Michigan's basketball hire a few years ago in Jawan Howard. I mean, Jawan Howard went to Michigan. He was a Michigan man through and through, uh, you know, beloved by fans, beloved by players. 
He was, um, you know, he was really, it was a big time hire for them. He was a high energy coach that the players loved. He took over a roster that had loads of talent left over from John Beeline. And because of that, Juwan Howard had immediate success. But as time went on and has, you know, that talent that was left over from John Beeline dwindled and he had to bring in his own guys, it's kind of become evident that Juwan Howard is not a great identifier of talent. He's not a great recruiter. He has not assembled a great coaching staff around him. And he's not great at drawing up plays. And, you know, he hasn't really been able to maintain that tough, gritty, peak in March culture that Michigan basketball had had for so long. And because of that, really, he's lost all traction with the Michigan basketball program. And the program has slowly deteriorated around him, at, despite that initial success and despite how much fans and players loved him those first couple years. And I'm a little afraid that might be the case with Sharon Moore. Because people right now seem to think that because he handled those three games at the end of the season uh, without Harbaugh so well and they were able to win those games and, you know, the players loved him so much and he had that iconic crying speech after they beat Penn State. And people seem to think because of how those games went that Sharon Moore is ready to take over the program as a whole. But you also have to remember during that three game suspension, Jim Harbaugh was with the team Sunday through Friday in full capacity. He had his full hands in the in the you know game plan that week. Michigan, as I've said a few times already, already had 40 plus upperclassmen on that team as well. I mean, they, that team was so experienced, they could have operated probably without a head coach. And I'm, I'm not even exaggerating there. I mean, essentially every starter on both sides of the ball were multi-year starters for Michigan. And because of, you know, Jim Harbaugh being around during the week and because of how experienced this team was, I would argue that Sharon Moore did not have that much more on his plate in those three game days than he usually did. I mean, he was already the play caller and you add in a halftime speech and being more in charge of those second half adjustments, that's essentially what changed. And I don't think... You know, with everything that was going on at Michigan at the time, the way people were talking about their leader, Jim Harbaugh, with how much scrutiny they were under, the national attention, and really just the negative talk that was surrounding a team that was as, a ta as talented and as experienced as Michigan, Sharon Moore really did not have to do that much to rally his team. I mean, the script was written for him. And, you know, it's great to see how much players love him, and it's great to see... Um, you know, everyone from the fans to the players to the administration backing Sean Moore and being this confident in him because, I mean, you have to be when you're transitioning from a coach like Jim Harbaugh. You have to be all in on the replacement if you want them to have success. But, I mean, we can't pretend that the sole reason Michigan was able to win those three games at the end of the regular season was because of Sean Moore and his coaching and genius. I mean, having leaders like J.J. McCarthy and Blake Corum, Roman Wilson, Mike Sainra still, Rod Moore, Junior Colson, I mean, I could really go on. Having those types of leaders on the team made Sharon's more job than manageable. And you have to remember, or you have to keep in mind, that there is a huge step up from being the offensive coordinator and play caller to being the head coach and essentially CEO of a big-time program like Michigan. Uh, you know, I mean, I think given Sharon Moore's limited experience, I'm not convinced that he is ready for all the responsibilities that fall on the head coach in the year 2024. I mean, first and foremost, you have to be able to delegate effectively. I mean, head coaches cannot do everything nowadays. There is so much on your shoulders, and that's a big reason why fewer and fewer of the best coaches in college football, at least the offensive-oriented ones, uh, call plays. It's something that head coaches kind of tend to give up now. And you also have to be able to hire a great staff around you and surround yourselves with coaches who can elevate the program and elevate specific position groups. Because again, Sean Moore isn't going to have his hand in every offensive skill position group and the offensive line as much, he's not going to be able to spend as much time day-to-day -day really developing those players. He's going to have to be able to find coaches that are able to do that. And that goes back to delegating and be able to give trust that they can overtake those kinds of responsibilities. And then roster management as a whole is so much more complex than it was even just five years ago, let alone 10, 15 years ago in college football. I mean, you have to recruit three or four recruiting classes simultaneously um, you have to convince quality backups to stay with your program rather than jumping ship to go find NIL deals or more playing time somewhere else. And then you also have to worry about bringing in the right guys. I mean, you have to bring in talent and utilize NIL or else fans are going to get on your back. And yet, But not only it's important to not only bring in talent via the transfer portal, but you have to bring in the right talent and players that align with your school and their culture and your team needs. And you also have to work with the university and 
boosters and fundraisers to increase NIL. I mean, it stretches really far, and this all falls squarely on the shoulders of the head coach. And Sharon Moore, he's been around Michigan since 2018. He's definitely, he's seen some ups and he's seen some downs with Michigan. But his experience prior to being at this school is very limited. He was assistant head coach for one year at Central Michigan. And before that, he has a few years of being a tight end coach and graduate assistant. And that's kind of it. I mean, like I said, he's gotten great experience under Jim Harbaugh at Michigan. But we can't expect Sharon Moore to be an exact replica of Jim Harbaugh. I mean, that's just not fair. And he'll need to figure out how to do things his own way. He'll need to pull from his prior experience and he'll have to adapt to the ever-changing sport of college football because as much as college football has changed in the past three to five years, gotta figure it's gonna change even more in the next five years. So he's gonna have to kind of get with the program and continue to adapt his game and his coaching style and his roster management style and all that stuff with the changing sport that is college football. And at this point, I can't point to anything he's done before Michigan um, or I can't coach, point to coaches that he's been under before Michigan, other than Jim Harbaugh, frankly, uh, that makes me think he's ready to navigate a big-time program like Michigan into the unknown. It's just he doesn't have the resume, in my opinion, that makes me think, yeah, he can, he can lead the ship at Michigan into, like I said, the unknown, which is really what the future of Michigan is looking like. Um, and so he's been the head coach for a couple weeks now, and in my opinion, he's already kind of off to a rocky start at some of the coaching decisions that he has made. So he gave up play calling duties, or at least he intends to, uh, which I think is smart. Like that decision, I mean, you saw Ryan Day had to finally do it this past off this offseason as well for Ohio State. There's just so much going on in college football. It weighs on coaches a lot to have to call plays and worry about that, you know, throughout the week when you're trying to game plan and you're also simultaneously recruiting and everything like that. So it is, um, I think I mentioned in the last podcast uh, last week, uh, there's actually, since the national championship game has been introduced in 1998, there's only been one head coach who called plays and won a national championship, and that was Jim Trestle back in 2022. And, you know, I think offenses have changed a little bit since Ohio State won that national championship. So it's a smart decision for him to give up play calling duties. But it sounds like he is keeping that offensive coordinator play caller position in-house and elevating quarterback coach Kirk Campbell to be the new uh, play caller. And Kirk Campbell, he's been with Michigan for two years, but his only play calling experience before Michigan or before this season was at Old Dominion in 2020 and 2021. And he actually had his play calling duties taken away in the middle of 2021. And that ended up sparking a big turnaround for Old Dominion. Uh, they were two and six, I believe, and they ended up going on a big win streak after uh, Kirk Campbell lost his play calling duties and ended up finishing six and six. And that season, in the games that he play called, their offense averaged 23 points a game. And once he, his play calling duties were taken away, Kirk Campbell's, I mean, that old Dominion offense averaged 36 points a game. That's 13 more than when Kirk Campbell was calling plays. And that's his kind of claim to fame right now as being as an offensive coordinator and um, play caller. So he was let go after 2021, and then he had to go to Michigan to be an offensive assistant. And now just two years later, he's in charge of this entire Michigan offense. Why? Because, I mean, he had a quarterback as talented as J.J. McCarthy fall in his lap. Uh, because next year, they don't have J.J. McCarthy. They're likely starting Alex Orgy at quarterback next year. And, you know, he is he's great with his legs. He's a super athlete, but he's a really raw passer. And he needs a lot of development. He needs a lot of fine tuning. And he, I think, in my opinion, needs a coach who has a proven track record of elevating offenses and developing quarterbacks and making offenses easy for first time quarterbacks or first first year starting quarterbacks and Kirk Campbell is not that from what I can tell um you know he hasn't developed a great quarterback before and I th feel like a lot of responsibility is being thrust on him just because he's been on one of the best coaching staffs in the country but it's just it's a lot to put on such an inexperienced guy whose only play calling duties kind of fell flat on his face and Michigan's also losing defensive coordinator Jesse Minter one of the best defensive coordinators in all of college football and their director of strength and development, Ben Herbert. And you might think, you know, director of strength and development, who really cares about that? But Ben Herbert's been with Michigan since 2018, and he's been integral to this team's culture of, of toughness that's been associated with them through this three-year stretch. And honestly, if you ask Michigan fans, I think they're probably a little bit more upset about Ben Herbert leaving Michigan than Jim Harbaugh, because 
at least they had some expectations that Jim Harbaugh was going to be leaving. Ben Herbert was a big surprise, and you could tell, you know, Michigan player reactions on Twitter uh, were really taken aback by by that announcement that he was going to be joining Jim Harbaugh uh, in Los Angeles along with with Jesse Minter. <clears throat> and, you know, Sean Moore, once again, decided to promote people within to fill those positions. And I think, you know, that that's, once again, great for continuity in 2024. It would be terrible for this team and their culture and their trajectory heading into the future if Sharon Moore or any other coach that they had brought in completely cleaned house and brought in an entirely new coaching staff and uh, that didn't have any relationship with these players. Um, that would put Michigan in a really tight bind. But I do think there is a happy medium between you know, cleaning house and having a completely new coaching staff and not bringing in a single outside hire, which is what Sharon Moore has done so far. And, you know, we're pretty late into the hiring cycle to start build to really build out a coaching staff. It's looking like Michigan will go into next season without a single outside hire. And it, it kind of seems to me like Sharon Moore is looking around at these lower end assistants at Michigan um, that they've had the past couple of years and thinking, yep, this is good enough to, to compete for a championship again. Never mind the fact that we're losing 50 players to the NFL, to the portal, to graduation, but this coaching staff is good enough. And it is true, Michigan has had one of the best coaching staffs in the entire country over the past few years, but it wasn't because of all these assistant coaches that are sleeping giants in the coaching world. They're going to end up being um, you know, head coaches in five years' time. Some of them very well may be sleeping giants in the coaching world. I mean, we might see a lot of these guys shoot up through the ranks really quickly, but I mean, make no mistake, it was Jim Harbaugh that was made everything work. He hand, he was the architect behind this entire program. He was the beacon that led Michigan through plenty of rocky times over the past nine years. And he was the one that handpicked everyone in that coaching room. And I'm telling you right now, Sharon Moore, Kirk Campbell, and, and Steve Klingscale, who is the replacement defensive coordinator now, them alone, they are not enough to lead Michigan to Big Ten championships and college football playoff appearances all by themselves over the next five years because when the talent starts to dry out and Michigan I think is going to wish that they had a coach whether it be a head coach or a, a, a big time a coordinator they're going to wish that they had someone on this coaching staff that had experience winning at the highest levels of college football outside of the past three years at Michigan um, they're going to wish that they had a Bill O'Brien Chip Kelly a Joe Brady or Glenn, uh, Glenn Schumann, Georgia's co-defensive coordinator, they're going to wish they had some, someone like that outside of 2024 when this talent starts to dry up a little bit. And believe me, the talent will dry up at Michigan. Um, Michigan's last two recruiting classes were outside the top 15. The 2025 class, which is very early, mind you, is off to a really slow start. They only have three commitments so far outside of the top 30 nationally. Um, and I mean, the reality is Jim Harbaugh brought Michigan out of, a, uh, out of a big recruiting slump. I mean, before he got there, Michigan was going through a stretch where they were barely bringing in recruiting classes that were in the top half of the Big Ten. And so I don't expect them to fall back to that kind of level, but to think that there won't be a drop-off in recruiting without having a guy like Jim Harbaugh on your program, uh, I think to think there wouldn't be a drop-off would be kind of ignorant. And a drop-off from having, you know, marginal top 15 classes, you got to think now they're going to be having like marginal top 25 classes. And, you know, that's a big drop off in the kind of talent that's consistently coming into your program and in filling those pipelines. And I think Sean Moore is going to lean into that developmental attitude that Michigan has really embraced and don't expect to see many, if, if any at all, top 10 classes come out of him. And if that's the direction that he's going to go into, if you're going to rely on bringing in three star type guys and, you know, develop, developing him over developing them over two, three, four years and hoping they stick around for, you know, four or five years and be multi-year starters. If that's the route that he's going to go, which I think it will be because it's kind of been Michigan's calling card the past few years, you need to have a great coaching staff. You need to have a coaching staff that knows what you knows what they're doing, that knows how to recruit players, how to recruit the right players, how to keep them around and how to develop them. And I think Sharon Moore's inexperience, uh, the coaching decisions he's made so far, not bringing in anyone from the outside to try to elevate this program a little bit, with Jim Harbaugh no longer in the building. And I think Michigan's general history of hiring in, in, in general has me concerned that Michigan will have that great coaching staff to lean on. And when I say Michigan's you know, history of making questionable hires, 
let's not forget that Jim Harbaugh went through a plethora of offensive assistants and offensive coordinators in those six years before he really figured out the offense in 2021. It took him a while to kind of figure out the right coaching staff to have. And Michigan as a university, in the past 35 years, they've only had to hire three head coaches. One was Jim Harbaugh, who went to Michigan and I think was more so recruited by the fans than anyone else. There wasn't a whole lot of canvassing that Michigan had to do to fill that job in 2015. And then before that, it was Brady Hoke in 2011 and Rich Rodriguez in 2008. Those are the only two hiring decisions they've had to make in the past 35 years. And both of those were really bad hires. Michigan went 46 and 44 under those two head coaches, a combined 3 and 16 versus Ohio State, Penn State, and Michigan State, zero Big Ten titles, and zero BCS or New Year's Six wins. And I mean, those were just objectively bad hires because you have to remember Rich Rodriguez came in with that spread option attack from West Virginia that he made so famous with Pat White. But Installing an offense like that required a complete overhaul of the roster that was built for a pro-style offense under Lloyd Carr, and he finally started to get it turned around in year three, but then Michigan fired him, right as he was, you know, finally got to a bowl, finally had some momentum in the program, and they fired him for Brady Hoke, a Michigan man who ran that classic pro-style offense that Michigan fans were missing, but that once again required a complete overhaul of the roster uh, that was once that was built for the spread option attack to go back to the pro-style offense. And this was before, you know, NIL and the transfer portal it was much more difficult. It took several years to really revamp a roster like that. So, I mean, those kind of just illogical hires have followed Michigan and really haunted them for a lot of their history. And, and now they make this decision with Sharon Moore, which, again, I understand. But you know, it's almost like that experiment with kids, you know, where you, um, you can give them a marshmallow or you ask them, do you want one marshmallow right now? Or you can have two marshmallows, but you have to wait an hour. And, you know, taking one marshmallow right now is going to taste really good in the moment. And when you look at all the other kids in the room that chose two marshmallows in an hour, and you have your one marshmallow and you see them without one, it's going to make you, in the moment, make you feel like you made the right decision. But then you wait an hour and you get to see all the other kids eating their two marshmallows, and you're going to wish you made the other decision. And this Ron Moore hire is. I th is um, and his decision to retain every coach on the coaching staff and not bring in anyone from the outside, I, I think is kind of like deciding to take that one marshmallow right now. Because, I mean, this they keeping Sharon Moore and keeping that coaching staff intact and not bringing in anyone else, I think is a big reason why they retain the players they did and a big reason why they will still win nine or 10 games next year and will be contending for the college football playoff. Again, thanks to the talent that Harbaugh left them. But in three to five years, when you know the Sharon Moore charmed wears off a little bit and the roster is full of players that are handpicked by Sharon Moore and his new staff, and they no longer have a consistently top five defense nationally to lean on to make their conservative offensive approach work. Um, and once you know there are a few steps behind Ohio State again, once Michigan's going eight and four in a few years, because I think all of this is going to happen under, under Sharon Moore. I think when that starts to happen in three to five years, I think Michigan fans are going to really wish that they had taken a bigger swing on this head coaching hire than just kind of settling for Sharon Moore because it was the logical decision and because the players really wanted to. Um, and so, and at that point too, the problem will be that Michigan won't be as appealing of a job as it is right now. I mean, if you were going to take a, make a big time head coaching hire, now is the time to do it coming off a national championship. I mean, it's as appealing of a job as Michigan has ever been. And you know what? Sharon Moore proved me wrong. I could be, I could be dead wrong about this, and he could carry everything that, Michigan, that Harbaugh accomplished. He could take everything that he learned from Harbaugh and bring them into the future and keep Michigan in power. But I just, given what I've seen out of his experience and what he's done so far, I am skeptical about that. So essentially, to sum up, the Sharon, Sharon Moore hire at surface level makes sense. It helps keep a lot of pieces of this team together and will allow Michigan to make a run at the playoff in 2024. But I'm just not convinced that Sharon Moore is the answer for long-term success at Michigan. And frankly, if I'm ranking my top 10 programs over the next 5 to 10 years, Michigan probably isn't in there. Uh, but that's enough about Michigan. Uh, I've been talking about them for quite a lot. We're going to move into our next segment now, 
uh, college football playoff predictions 2.0 edition for February. Because believe it or not, a lot has changed since the last time we did this. Uh, Because when I recorded our last episode here, the 30-day transfer portal for Washington, Arizona, and Alabama had just opened. Jim Harbaugh had not yet left Michigan. And there was still a decent amount unsettled around college football. But now most of the, you know, rosters are pretty short up. Anyone that's transferring out of one of those programs that lost the coach has kind of made their decision. Uh, Most coaching staffs are really put together at this point. So it just kind of feels a little bit more settled now, at least until when the spring transfer portal opens, because we'll see some more reshuffling then. But I think right now we are at a, a better point to predict how, I mean, how these teams are going to perform next season and what these rosters are looking like and what the coaching staffs are looking like. So let's dive right into it because we have a brand new bracket to break down. And if you're listening or watching on YouTube, you can see the bracket on your screen now. But we'll start off with the upper left bracket with the one seed. And with the one seed, who gets that? Uh, who gets one of those bye weeks? I'm staying with Georgia. At the end of the day, Carson Beck, he's a top 10 quarterback in the country. Uh, Oscar Delp, I think he's going to be another great playmaker at the tight end position to um, replace Brock Bowers. He was the number one tight end in the 2022 class. Uh, They returned two of their top receivers in Dominique Lovett and Rara Thomas, who should both take another step in their development. They also added six foot five wide receiver Colby Young from Miami. He had almost 600 receiving yards and uh, five touchdowns last year as a true sophomore. And they add running back Trevor Etienne from Florida, one of the best running back prospects in the country. And they return three starters on the offensive line. So I think this Georgia offense is, is going to be electric. I think it's going to take a big step forward from what we saw last year. And the defense loses some pieces, but I don't think defense is ever going to be a question under Kirby Smart. Now, whether they are a top five unit or a top 15 unit will kind of be that determining factor in the college football playoff for them. And that'll be the determining factor in whether they can win a third title in four seasons. But at the end of the day, I think Kirby Smart has earned that Uh, status of just, you know, going into every season, knowing that they're going to have an elite defense. He's done it enough. I'm kind of putting my blind faith in that defensive side of the ball with him there. And, you know, either way, no matter how good this defense is, I think there's enough talent on this Georgia roster to win the SEC, secure one of the top two spots in the college football playoff. And the main reason they're number one right now is because I think they have the highest floor of any team in college football. They might not reach the highs that we saw in those back-to-back championship runs, but they're going to be a really good team. And they're, they're a very safe number one to have right now. So Georgia in this bracket will be awaiting the winner of Notre Dame and Penn State, that 8-9 matchup. Uh, so Notre Dame is would host that game because they're the eight seed. And I really like Notre Dame because, I, think, I mean, this defense is absolutely loaded. They're easily going to be one of the top five defenses in college football next year. They return almost their entire defensive line. And linebacker Jack Kaiser is really going to help uh, keep that defensive front um, you know, together. And they return one of the best defenders in all of college football and safety, Xavier Watts. He was an All-American last year, Should be um, barring injury, should be a first-team consensus All-American next year. And I don't foresee this defense having any collapses like we saw against Louisville and Clemson last year that really cost them. I think this is going to be an absolutely great unit uh, in Marcus Freeman's third year. They will have to replace three starters on the offensive line as well as running back Audric Esteem, who was one of the best in the country last year, but their pass catchers should be much stronger in 2024, and that was a big weakness of theirs last year, not having guys that could really, you know, push the, I mean, help push the ball downfield or consistently win con- contested catches. Uh, the wide receiver group was a struggle for Notre Dame last year, and it should be one of their strengths maybe next year. I mean, they returned Jaden Thomas, uh, Jaden Greathouse, and Mitchell Evans, and they add a couple other guys from the transfer portal. And they have an incredibly deep running back room. And I actually think quarterback Riley Leonard, who's coming over from Duke, I think he'll fit this offense a little bit better than Sam Hartman, who I guess wasn't very mobile, to say the least. Um, I think Riley Leonard's mobility and his ability to throw on the run will help open up a lot in this offense, as well as hide some deficiencies on the offensive line, because that's definitely their biggest question mark right now. Um, But With how great the defense will be, I don't think this offense will have to do as much as they had to last year in order to win 10 games. And looking at their schedule, they have road games at Texas A&M and USC and home games against Louisville and Florida State. And those are the only four games that shouldn't be easy wins for them. 
all of them are winnable. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if Notre Dame is favored in every single game this year. So 12-1 and is on the table. 11-1 and is certainly doable. And honestly, 10-2 and might be all they need in order to get into the playoff. So I really like Notre Dame this season. And I have Penn State at number nine. They did move up a little bit from my last rankings, even though nothing has really changed for Penn State since the last edition. Um, but I think them moving up has more so to do with the faith that I have in their new coordinators and their ability to have a positive impact on Penn State next season and allow them to hit that 10 win mark, which I think 10 wins is really, I, I, there definitely will be probably, I, I, I would imagine a 10 win team that doesn't make the playoff, but I think that's kind of the goal that every team should have. Like if we get 10 wins, we're going to have a really good shot at the playoff. And yes, wide receiver is still a question mark for Penn State. They just simply weren't good enough at that position last year. And their only addition so far has been Julian Fleming from Ohio State, who's, I think, a reliable number three receiver to have, but he is not the wide rec- alpha wide receiver one that a lot of people expected him to be coming out of high school. So um, they do return Keandre Lambert-Smith, who's still a great deep threat, still has great speed and is a really good athlete. They do have one of the best running back duos in the entire country in Nick Singleton and Katron Allen. I feel like they lost a lot of momentum from the public eye because of how Penn State's offense struggled last year. But don't make no mistake of how talented they still are. They also have a great tight end in Tyler Warren. And I just love offensive coordinator Andy Kotelnicki from Kansas because, I mean, he's first and foremost is a tremendous step forward from Mike Yurchich at offensive coordinator because Kotelnicki adjusts his scheme based on the personnel. He is not one to try to fit a round peg into a square hole or anything like that because his scheme is so broad. It's a lot of different offenses combined into one. At its base, it's essentially a pro-style offense that just uses a multitude of formations and a lot of modern spread concepts. But, I mean, he has a really large playbook and he is able to adjust it based on their personnel. And I think when you look at um, Penn State's playmakers, yeah, the wide receiver might be a question mark, but they have two running backs that are particularly Nick Singleton that are great pass catchers out of the backfield and Tyler Warren at tight end will be a matchup nightmare and I think if you have guys at running back and tight end that are able to catch the ball as well as they are that's how I mean that's probably the easiest place to exploit mismatches because they're often going to be guarded by a linebacker or a safety and Kotal Nicky really focuses on getting the best playmakers the ball in their hands and getting them the ball in space so with what they have you know, it's certainly, I don't think maybe championship level, but I think Kotal Nicky can be counted on to improve this offense as a whole and get the most out of their skill position player as possible. I also think Drew Aller will take a step forward next year. He definitely had his struggles last year, but I would definitely not put all of the offensive struggles on his shoulders. He's still a talented guy going into just his third season. I think he has a lot to prove and will step up in 2024. And the offense will require less of him. It will allow him to be more decisive. And like I said, Kotelnicki's scheme will elevate the skill position players and mask the losses that they have on the offensive line. So as a whole, I think Penn State's offense will get better. The defense does lose a lot, but they also return a lot with guys like linebacker Abdul Carter, defensive tackle Devon Ellis, and safety Jalen Reed. All will be on the All-Big Ten watch. And I think Penn State could very well have a top 10 defense in the country next year, which means the offense, which I definitely think we'll get better. They won't have to move mountains in order to reach 10 wins. And Penn State plays USC, Wisconsin, Ohio State, and Washington. Those are their four tough games on the schedule next year. I think it's definitely tough to predict them to beat Ohio State, even though they are getting that game at home. But they should be favored in those other three games, USC, Washington, Wisconsin. And I think 11-1 and is certainly on the table and could be a really good bet for Penn State. So that is the upper left uh, little bracket. You have Georgia awaiting the winner of Penn State at Notre Dame. And then below them, we have the four seed, Florida State, who is my preseason ACC champion. I think uh, DJ Uyunglele coming to Florida State is going to make that matchup with Clemson really, really interesting. But also keep in mind, ACC also got rid of their divisions. So that game could very, very well be a warm up for the ACC championship game. Um, but I have Florida State as my preseason ACC favorite, mainly because of my faith in Mike Norvell. I love the trajectory he ha- he is going in with Florida State, and I definitely have more faith in him right now than I do Dabo Sweeney, based off of what I've seen the past couple of years. Um, Florida State does lose a lot on their defensive front, 
but they return linebacker uh, DJ Lundy, who should keep that defensive front kind of knitted together. He should be he'll be the leader of that defense, and they should have one of the best country's best secondaries because they return virtually everyone in that back end. Uh, offense also loses a lot. Like make no mistake, Florida State is replacing a lot of talent, and that much was evident in their bowl game against Georgia. But they do return r- running back Lawrence uh, Toy Toa Feely, uh, wide receiver Jaki Davis, and three starters on the offensive line. I uh, don't expect DJ Uyunglele to take a huge step forward and all of a sudden be throwing for 350 yards a game, but I think he has a no- more talent around him than he had last year at Oregon State, and I think his veteran leadership will keep this offense together and make them one of the ACC's best units next year. So four-seed Florida State, they're going to be awaiting the matchup of Boise State at Oregon. And funny enough, if this actually comes to fruition, this would be a rematch of a game in September. Boise State is traveling to Eugene to play Oregon. And um, a side note here, because this is something that kind of went over my head a little bit. And when I did my last predictions for the bracket playoff bracket, um, when this format was instituted, we had the five power five conferences. And um, so the playoff included those five conference champions and then the one highest ranked group of five conference champion. But obviously with conference realignment, we only have four power conferences now, the Big Ten, ACC, Big 12, and SEC. But the college football playoff did not update their, um, their how, how they run the playoff, essentially. They didn't update it to account for that. So there's still the six highest strength conference champions going to the playoff, which means we're going to see two group of five teams, two group of five conference champions make the playoff. So in this case, Boise State gets the 12 seed. That makes them the second group of five team that I have them that I have in the playoff. And, you know, honestly, I think picking group of five teams at this point in the offseason is kind of like shooting darts at a dartboard with a blindfold on. But I like Boise State because Malachi Nelson, uh, the five star quarterback from the 2023 class, he transfers in from USC. And I think he should help elevate this offense alongside one of the best dual threat uh, run, running backs in um, in the country. I mean, he had almost 2,000 scrimmage yards at over seven and a half yards uh, per touch. And uh, Spencer Danielson, who was their interim coach last year, uh, really kind of sparks the season at the end of the year. He's now their permanent head coach and seems to have some momentum in the Boise State program for the first time, seemingly since Chris Peterson left for Washington. And that was ages ago now. And I also like Boise State because they play in the Mountain West, which is a conference that doesn't have a lot of super competitive teams. I'm looking, it seems like UNLV, Air Force, Fresno State, likely Boise State's top competition. I did, like I did mention, they do travel to Eugene to play Oregon, which is a tough break because, you know, assuming they lose that game, they will probably have to win the rest of their games in order to be one of the two highest ranked group of five conference champions. But it also might kind of help them because if they do manage to stay competitive in that game, what will be a top five matchup for them, it might end up giving them the benefit of the doubt in the committee's eyes. They could earn some respect for playing that game close. And then when they're compared to other mid-major teams that have the same record, but have no games against the top 25 opponents, might give Boise State the benefit of the doubt there. So I have them as one of my two group of five teams in the playoff right now. And then number five, Oregon, that makes them the top at-large bid. And I've talked before about how much I love Oregon this year. They don't have a glaring weakness on their entire roster. They're stacked at every single position and should improve from last year despite the departure of Bo Nix, mainly because they have Dylan Gabriel, who uh, comes over from Oklahoma, has 40 career starts under his belt. I think he's easily a top 10 quarterback in the country. And then at running back, Jordan James, Noah Washington, and transfer addition, Jay Harris. Those three should be more than enough to replace Bucky Irving at uh, running back, who was their kind of big loss on that side of the ball. And then Tez Johnson and Jeremiah McClellan very well could be the best wide receiver duo in all of college football next year. And they returned four starters on the offensive line. So, I mean, like I said, they don't have a weakness. And then on the defensive side of the ball, they have the versatile defensive end, Jordan Birch, who can really line up anywhere on that defensive line. And linebackers Justin Jacobs and Jeffrey Bassa, who's going to lead a stout defensive front. And then the secondary did lose a lot of talent, but they brought in UTSA uh, cornerback Cam Alexander and Washington cornerback Jabbar Muhammad. Uh, Each of them were probably the best cornerback in their entire conferences, in their respective conferences last year. And they returned Jaleel uh, Florence, 
who was a starter last year. So they have three formidable cornerbacks. And then in the back end, they, ha- they bring in Kansas State safety Kobe Savage. He was a multi-year starter for them. And they return Tysheem Johnson. So they are really set up at every single position. Only weaknesses I can see, and I'm really picking hairs here, is they kind of seem to have a lack of a proven elite pass rusher because uh, Jaden Birch, who I mentioned, he his specialty is more so you know versatility and eating up blocks. And they also seem to lack some depth at linebacker or safety. So if injuries occur there, they could be in some trouble. And there is, I guess, a question mark who the third receiving option will be behind Tez Johnson and Jeremiah McClellan. But they've been recruiting so well, I got to figure they have a pipeline of talent <laughs> kind of sitting there. So I think this is easily one of the, the five most talented rosters in the country. Dan Lanning will have Oregon ready to compete for a Big Ten championship in 2024 and for years to come. So that's the left side of the bracket. We have um, one of those six teams, Georgia, Notre Dame, Penn State, Florida State, Oregon, and Boise State. In these predictions, we'll be playing for a national championship. So let's move over to the right side of the bracket. We're going to start on the top with our two seed, Ohio State. And it feels weird because I, I talked up Ohio State so much in the last episode, and they only got better since that episode came out um, with adding Bill O'Brien as offensive coordinator and Caleb Downs at safety from Alabama, who was the best cornerback. I mean, sorry, the best freshman. Um, He plays safety, but he was the best freshman in all of college football last year. They have those two additions since my last episode, and I talked about how much talent they're returning and bringing in from the portal. And the defense, I mean, again, I said this last episode, and it's only more true with the addition of Caleb Downs. Um, Their defense is approaching all-time great status, and on paper, that is, you know, Off-season accolades don't mean anything. This won't matter until we see them on the field. But, you know, with Caleb Downs coming in and playing safety, the assumption is Sonny Styles, who was one of the best recruits in his recruiting class, he's entering his third year, former five-star. He's likely moving to linebacker. And so that means Ohio State is essentially returning 10 starters from a defense that was top three in almost every statistical category last year. They're going to be scary good. And then offensively, they have the best backfield in college football, and it's not particularly close with Quinshawn Judkins from Ole Miss and Travion Henderson. You can rely on them to have improved quarterback play uh, with, I'm sorry, Will Howard. And um, I think Ohio State has the highest ceiling in all of college football and should be number one or number two at everyone's preseason rankings, at least at this point in the offseason, unless something major changes along the way. Um, But I'm keeping them at number two, mainly because a lot of this is based off of speculation. I mean, their offensive line still has a ways to improve from last year if they want to be uh, championship worthy. It helps that they bring back all Big Ten guard Donovan Jackson and the addition of Seth McLaughlin from Alabama, but they need drastically better play from their tackles. And Ohio State right now seems to be at capacity for roster spots. So unless we see some more transfers out of the program and, um, in the spring, I don't know how much more room they have to bring in competition at the tackle position. So offensive line should be better next year, but will it get to the point it needs to be remains to be seen. So honestly, until I see with my own two eyes that this offensive line is much better and that Will Howard is a substantial improvement over Kyle McCord, I can't move Ohio State ahead of Georgia. Now, we'll wait to the spring. If they look you know, unbeatable in the spring game, we can talk about moving them ahead of them. But until then, Georgia deserves that number one spot. I mean, they've won 30 of their past 31 games. So number two, Ohio State will be awaiting the matchup of Alabama at Ole Miss. That could be a really fun matchup because, you know, if they played every season for, I mean, who knows how many years playing in the SEC West together. This year is the first time in a really long time they don't play. And in these projections, uh, Ole Miss would be hosting Alabama likely as the favorite for um, in the playoff for a chance to go play Ohio State. Like, I mean, the the stakes for this game would be at an all-time high. It'd be a really fun watch. But I like Ole Miss because I think uh, their running back, Ulysses Bentley, who's been with the program for a really long time, he's a really talented guy. He'll be a fine replacement for Quinshawn Judkins. I think Jackson Dart is easily the second-best quarterback in the SEC behind Quinn Ewers. And they brought in nine transfer portal additions on defense, and which would really help improve that side of the ball. And, you know, they do, of course, have a lot of player player turnover, but 
they shouldn't face a challenge in their first six games. They should have an easy path to 6-0 and all by uh, two or more possessions, and that'll give them an opportunity to really gel. And you know how I mentioned with Kirby Smart, you can always count on him having a good defense. Well, I think the same can be said with Lane Kiffin on the offensive side of the ball, so I'm not really worried about that. And um, I think the only three games next season, looking at their schedule, that they won't be heavy favorites in are at LSU and then at home against Oklahoma and Georgia. And I think they can win two of those games. They only may need to win one of those games in order to make the college football playoff. Who knows? But um, Ole Miss is definitely an easy choice for, for the playoff right now. And then Alabama. They definitely slipped from my last edition, but I'm keeping them in the playoff um, because, you know, despite Nick Saban returning, I mean, retiring, despite all the transfers out of the program, I believe that Kalen DeBoer will have as much, if not more, talent on this Alabama team than he had at Washington last year. I mean, the glue of this defense and linebacker Deontay Lawson returns, they'll have one of, if not the best, defensive line in the SEC. Jalen Milrow returns on offense should be one of the preseason Heisman favorites next season. And then running back Justice Hayes uh, should boost a running back room that simply never fails to produce. Seems like, I mean, every year for the past 20 years or so, they've had, um, you know, an NFL caliber, all-American type running back there. So I don't expect that to change next season. So offense as a whole may even get better than last year. And this pick more so has is just the faith in the foundation that Saban left behind at Alabama. Um, you know, because as of today, I mean, I'm expecting a team that's recruited as well as Alabama has and brought in a seasoned, experienced coach like DeBauer. I'm expecting a team like that to make the college football playoff. They are the 10 seed, which of course means that is the last uh, at-large bid that we're giving out. So the last portion of the bracket below Ohio State, our bottom right quadrant, um, three seed, Big 12 champion or my big t- preseason Big 12 favorite. Oklahoma State. And I mentioned this on the episode last week too. Um, I think, I mean, both sides of the ball uh, should improve from last year. On defense, linebacker uh, Colin Oliver and safety Kendall Daniels give Oklahoma State two leaders and potential All Americans in the back end of that defense. And I think having a strong back end of the defense is going to be key in the Big 12. I expect that to be a pass happy conference next year. Um, Defensive coordinator Brian Nardo enters his second season. Oklahoma State got better on the defensive side of the ball. In the back half of the season, I expect that side of the ball to get better next year. And then on offense, I don't kid when I say they return everyone on the offensive side of the ball. Quarterback Alan Bauman got a seventh year. Running back Ali Gordon decided to come back despite the fact that he had an absolutely ridiculous season last year and could have contended for the RB1 in the 2024 NFL draft. He decided to come back and they return all five starters on the offensive line. I think Oklahoma State is gearing up to be one of the more experienced teams in college football, and that's really what wins in November. So they're definitely my preseason favorite to win the Big 12, but if, that's going to be a really interesting conference. I also consider Utah, Arizona, Kansas State, Texas Tech as Big 12 champs, um, and all of those I think could challenge for at-large bids as well. But I do, at the end of the day, have a hard time seeing big, the Big 12 get more than two teams in, so that'll be a really interesting conference to watch. But right now, Oklahoma State, is the only team I have coming out of the Big 12, and they earn that number three seed. And then they would be awaiting the matchup of Texas and Liberty. Uh, Texas, you know, bloated at running back and wide receiver. They've recruited the offensive skill positions as well as anyone in the country over the past few seasons. But they're mainly this high because of the return of Quinn Ewers. Um, He is simply why I have Texas so high. I think he's going to have a Herculean season next year and be the consensus quarterback one in the 2025 NFL draft. They do have some question marks on defense. I mean, they're going to have to replace defensive tackle Tavondre Sweat, who's an absolute wrecking ball, and they'll have to retool their secondary. But I think Quinn Ewers and this offense should be able to keep Texas in every game this season, and I trust an experienced quarterback like Quinn Ewers to elevate his play when it matters most. And they would be hosting Liberty. Um, They are the 11 c which means they are the top uh, group of five conference champion that I have in the playoff. And again, this is mainly has to do with who they return at quarterback. Caden Salter, uh, he, you know, checked out the transfer portal, I guess, didn't see what he liked, came, comes back to Liberty, and he returns along with Liberty's entire backfield from 2023's top rushing offense. 
and they bring back three offensive line starters. So I think this offense should continue to hum next year. They return almost all of their cornerbacks and defensive ends from last year. So I really don't think there's much of a reason to expect a drop off uh, from Liberty next year. And they play in the Conference USA, which I mentioned it with the Mountain West. And I guess you can make an argument with a lot of these uh, group of five conferences, but they don't have a ton of challenging games. They could very well be favored in every single matchup next year. And their out of conference games are Campbell, Eastern Carolina, Appalachian State, and UMass. So they should be able to go 4 0 out of conference, which means they can likely afford themselves one regular season loss in the conference um, and still be able to win the conference and earn one of those two non, uh, non power conference championship spot, <laughs> spots in the college football playoff. So that's how the, uh, our bracket is looking right now. I feel a lot more confident in this edition than I did um, in the edition last month. But it's going to be a really crazy race with only six at-large spots between the four conferences. I mean, Michigan, Tennessee, Missouri, LSU, USC, Clemson, Arizona, Kansas State, and Utah, who I mentioned before. All of them I consider for the uh, playoff spot, and I'm sure there's going to be some sneaky teams that no one sees coming that's going to be challenging for the playoffs. So it's going to be a really, really interesting race. And just as interesting as all these conference races, I think, will actually be the race for the first and second at-large bids. Uh, so essentially the five and six seeds in this uh, bracket. And the reason why that's going to be such an interesting race this season is because, you know, let's assume I think the most likely scenario will be that the Big Ten and the SEC champions get the one and two seeds just because those conferences are far and away better than everyone else and they have the best teams in college football. I think the majority of everyone's preseason top tens will have Big Ten and SEC teams in there. So let's assume that they get the top two spots. I don't, I don't think that's a stretch. And then let's also assume that the bottom two seeds, 11 and 12, are the group of five, or yeah, the group of five conference champions. That means if you're the five and six seed, your first playoff game is a home game against a group of five school. I mean, they, you should be double digits. And that also means, you know, assuming you win that game, the second round of the playoffs in that final eight, you avoid the Big Ten and SEC champions, those one and two seeds. You'd be playing three and four, which presumably is um, the Big 12 and ACC champion. So it's just your path is so much better if you can get one of those top two at-large spots. Because just compare uh, Texas, who is the second at-large spot, and then right behind them would be Ole Miss. Texas's path, the way I have it set up right now, is at home versus Liberty, and then against Oklahoma State. I mean, they should be double-digit favorites over Liberty and probably over Oklahoma State, too. Compare that to Ole Miss, who's just one spot behind them in the rankings. They have to host Alabama and then play Ohio State. I mean, that path is just so much more difficult. So that's just a little kind of side story that I think is interesting in the playoff next season, is that you know, the conference races are going to be really interesting, but just as interesting as well will be the race for the top two at-large spots, those five and six seeds. But there you have it, the February edition of our projected playoff, and we'll continue to update this throughout the offseason as things change, but definitely feel a little bit better about this one than the January. And our final segment on episode two of the Big Ten Blitz is a new segment and another one that's going to be recurring as we progress throughout this offseason, Big Ten Heat Checks. It's essentially just hot takes or bold predictions, uh, this time tailored for the 2024 season. So heat check number one, going to go with Ohio State and Oregon. I think that they're going to play each other three times in 2024. First, on October 12th in Eugene. Second, in the Big Ten Championship. And third, in the college football playoff. Because I really think that both of these teams are that good. Their coaching staffs are that good and they're that talented that they will both be playing in the either the college football playoff semifinals or maybe even meeting up in the national championship. And the reason this is a, a hot take is because this would be uh, the first time since 1887 uh, that two teams would play each other three times in the same season. And it would, Michigan and Notre Dame did that back in 1887, but it is not something we have seen in modern college football at all. And uh, having teams play each other three times in the same season is something we actually could see a little bit more of because 
essentially every conference has gotten rid of divisions across college football. So, you know, if two of the best teams in any conference play each other during the regular season, it could be really likely that they rematch in the conference championship. And then with six, hopefully seven soon, uh, at-large bids, um, making the college football playoff every year, if, you know, they, those teams are really that good, they could very well make the playoff. And with such a small field of 12 teams, it's not that hard for them to meet up in the playoff. They would just have to win a few games. So this could be so interesting because, you know, playing and beating a quality team twice uh, in, in, you know, this level of football is hard enough. I mean, people tend to say, you know, if two, two, two good teams are rematching it, it tends to favor whoever lost that first game. So it's going to be, could be so interesting, the dynamic of playing a team three times in a three-month period. So, I mean, I kind of hope it happens because it'd be so interesting to see just how, how that game would play out and how one matchup could be so different than another. So um, that's the first heat check. Ohio State, Oregon playing each other three times in one season. Um, hot take number two. I don't think that Michigan or Washington will reach double-digit wins in 2024. And this would be, this is a hot take, even though it might not seem so at surface level. Um, this is a bold prediction because this would be the first time in the history of the national championship game that neither team that played for the championship in one season reached 10 wins the following year. And you, when you think about it, both of these teams are replacing big time head coaches. They're both returning single digit starters. They both have to replace multi-year starters at quarterback. And they both have brutal schedules in 2024. I mean, Michigan hosts Texas, USC, and Oregon and has road trips to Washington and Ohio State. Washington hosts Washington State, Michigan, and USC. And they have road trips to Penn State, Iowa, and Oregon. I mean, all of those games that I listed for both schools are losable. I mean, given how inexperienced they're going to be, Michigan and Washington could both end up with four losses. In fact, I'd be more surprised if either of te these teams got to 10 wins than it would be if they went 8-4. and four. And looking at their schedule, I mean, even seven wins for either of these teams wouldn't shock me. So I still, you know, generally like the trajectory of both of these programs, despite how I was talking about Michigan earlier in this program. But I, I think you can certainly expect a down year in 2024 from both of these teams as they tra transition out of that national championship game. And hot take number three. I'm going to go with Nebraska, uh, reaching the postseason for the first time since 2016. Not only that, I think Nebraska can get eight wins, which would be their, easily their best season in that stretch. Um, I mean, I think if you look back at 2023 for the Cornhuskers, I mean, their offensive line made a huge improvement last year. They went from, honestly, maybe the worst offensive line in the power conferences in 2022 to a fairly formidable unit considering how much that quarterback room struggled for them. Uh, they have Thomas Fidon, who's a potential all Big Ten tight end. The wide receiver room gets a big boost with the addition of Jamal Banks, who had over 100 catches and 1,200 receiving yards for Wake Forest last year. Uh, Jalen Lloyd, he's a name to keep an eye on. He could be a game changer in this offense. He's a speedy deep threat. He, uh, as a true freshman last year, he caught a 50 plus yard touchdown in three of their final five games. It was, you know, three of his only catches on the season. He didn't, uh, wasn't involved in the offense a whole lot in the first half of the season, but you know, he could be in for a big sophomore season. Their running back room returns two of their top three guys and adds Oregon transfer Dante Dowdle, who was a top 200 recruit in the 2023 class. And with Dylan Rayola at quarterback, I think this offense really could turn from one of the nation's worst into a fairly formidable unit. And not because I think Dylan Rayola, um, you know, if you don't remember who he is, number one quarterback in this incoming recruiting class who just flipped from Georgia. Um, and I'm not expecting Nebraska to take this big step forward because I think Dylan Rayola is that generational of a talent who can turn any offense into a juggernaut as a true freshman. I don't necessarily believe that, but it's because their quarterback play was so bad last year. The bar for Dylan Rayola to get over is so low. I mean, in order for him to be a significant improvement from what they had last year, he'll only really need to run two read plays and be consistently accurate within 15 yards of the line of scrimmage. And I think I mean, he's a really talented. He's got an incredible arm. I think he's definitely capable of that as a true freshman. And the defense was really the story of the year for Nebraska last year outside of how poorly their quarterbacks played. Um, I mean, they just made a tremendous improvement from 2022. Le did, I mean, learned Tony White's 3-3-5 defense flawlessly, which you never see in a big 
uh, transition like that in defensive philosophy. And they got a big boost with the return of linebacker John Bullock, and they have potential first-team All-Big Ten, maybe even All-American safety Isaac Gifford coming back. And like I said, they made tremendous strides in Tony White's first season. I think they'll make another jump in 2023. And you know, could very well be have one of the five best defenses in the conference. And looking at Nebraska's set schedule, they should be favored in their first seven games. In that stretch, they do have home games against Colorado, Northwestern, and Rutgers, and, and road trip to Purdue. And those all, games all definitely pose challenges for Nebraska. But I think they can certainly be 6-1 and one entering a, the final stretch of their schedule, which is Ohio State, UCLA, USC, Wisconsin, and Iowa. And that's a tough stretch, no matter who you are. But, you know, maybe if they already reach bowl eligibility by the time they hit that stretch, they could play a little looser because they've already achieved bowl eligibility. And I think any Nebraska fan would agree that is, you know, the floor that they have to reach in 2024 before a panic button is hit. So, you know, if they kind of play a little bit looser, if they kind of, um, I think they could pull off an upset or two. And I wouldn't be shocked if they win two of those final five games. Um, and they could set themselves up for a pretty nice bowl game and a surprise season. So I really believe in Matt Rule. I really like the trajectory he's taking Nebraska. And they didn't quite meet expectations last season, but I think this year will be the year that they kind of take that step forward. And my fourth and final Big Ten heat check comes out of Iowa. I think 2024 is going to be Kirk Ferentz's last year at Iowa. And... I didn't think of this until recently because, honestly, there is plenty of reason around optimism for Iowa right now. I mean, defensive coordinator Phil Parker returns. He's been having that unit humming despite how much um, talent they lose on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, defensive backs Jamari Harris and Sebastian Castro, uh, they both surprised me with their decisions to come back next year. They should be preseason all Big Ten players. But they do lose just an ungodly amount of talent in the defensive front. I mean, almost everyone... Uh, and every starter on the defensive line and linebacking core was like a fifth-year senior last year. They lose a lot. So, I mean, this is Iowa. They still have Phil Parker. They still have Kirk Ferentz. They should still have a really good defense, but I just don't, you know, the defense took a step back a little bit from 2022 last year, and I think it's just going to take another step back again in 2024. And then, you can, I mean, with Iowa, you can't help but turn your focus to the offensive side of the ball because of how dismal they have been for the past few years. And I had some optimism because, you know, they got rid of uh, offensive coordinator Kirk Ferentz's son, and they had a pretty extensive search for an offensive coordinator, and they return a lot. You know, majority of their offensive line comes back. Um, Caleb Brown, wide receiver who transferred from Ohio State last year, he kind of caught fire towards the end of the season last year. I think he could be in for a big year. Cade McNamara returns. I mean, LaShawn Williams and Caleb Johnson, a couple great running backs. They have a strong uh, running back room. So... It seems like they have pieces there. They just need an offensive mind that's willing to innovate and kind of bring this offense into the 21st century. And then they landed on Tim Lester. Chances are you have never heard of Tim Lester because um, you are probably not a fan of Mac football. Um, but he was Western Michigan's coach for six years. He went 37 and 32 over those six seasons, but he was fired after 2022 because he went five and seven. And the offense, and this is, you know, an offensive-oriented coach, Western Michigan's offense that year was outside the top 115 in scoring and total offense. So he was fired from Western Michigan, had to go take a senior analyst position for the Packers. And now he's back as offensive coordinator for Iowa. And when I saw this news, I probably had the same reaction as every Iowa fan. Like, really? This, this is the best you could do? I mean, this had to be their 10th or 12th choice. I mean, they had to have such a long list ahead of him because there are so many uh, offensive coordinators and assistants out there that they could have called. And I mean, I hope they at least tried. And it, I don't know what would hurt, hurt more, the fact that they might not reach out to, uh, to a good coach or that I, the Iowa job is this undesirable. But this hire gives me no faith in their offense. And call me a skeptic, and I really hope they prove me wrong because it'd be great to see Iowa kind of... Um, regain some momentum on that side of the ball because I just certainly think they have some talent that's been criminally underutilized over the years. But I just, there's, I look at Tim Lester's resume and I, I don't see anything that makes me think he can get anything more out of this offense than what we've seen over the past few years. And 
you know, it's time for Iowa to play big boy football. They can now, they're no longer hiding in the shadows of the dismal Big Ten West where they can be, you know, champions of the poor. They're playing some of the best teams in college football next year, and they will not get away with averaging 13 points a game on offense. And I don't see them taking a big step forward on the offensive side of the ball, and I think they're going to pay for it. I think we're going to see, Iowa is going to be on probably every preseason top 25 poll. I think they're going to be a you know, popular pick to go um, to win maybe nine games, maybe reach 10 and two. Not with this offensive hire. Sorry. Um, I, I can't have my expectations that high. And I really think there's a good chance to, I would go six and six. And I think Kirk Ferentz, you know, if this offensive coordinator doesn't pa- pan out, I think Kirk Ferentz will start to see the writing on the wall that he is just not built to bring Iowa into this new age of college football where you know, you have to recruit, you have to use the transfer portal, you have to have, you know, some some sort of NIL fund, and you have to you have to play offense. I mean, as silly as that sounds, you cannot completely forget about an entire side of the football. And I think Iowa is gonna have very similar offensive structure struggles to what as what we've seen over the past couple of years. And I think that might will be the final straw. I don't know if it'll be Iowa fans that, you know, throw their hands up and say we're we're done with Kirk Ferentz or if it's finally going to be him saying I just can't do this anymore I can't coach Iowa to a level that I want them to be but I think Iowa takes a big step back this year and I think because of that Kirk Ferentz is going to have no choice but to leave the college game I think the college college football will sorely miss him if that's the case I hope it's not I would love to see Iowa you know step into the the new millennium on the offensive side of the ball I would love to see Iowa compete for Big Ten championships without being bolstered up by the Big Ten West, but I just don't love their odds of it, given this offensive hire with with uh, Tim Lester as their offensive coordinator. But that was my my final Big Ten heat check. Plenty more to come, and that's also the end of this episode. End of Big Ten Blitz episode two. Hope you enjoyed. Um, if you don't already, please go follow us on Twitter or X, whatever you'd like to call it, at The Floor Slap. Uh, check us out, our website, thefloorslap.com. And as always, I've been your host, Sean. Big Ten Blitz will be back. Hopefully by the end of the month, we'll have new episodes coming out at at least monthly, hopefully every few weeks throughout this offseason. We're going to cover more of the NFL draft, more of spring football. And check out our website for some great articles from Jordan, who's covering the college basketball season right now. Um, got a lot of great stuff planned, so follow along as the floor stop and the Big Ten Blitz grows. Um, appreciate you hanging in there. Have a great rest of the week. Hope enjoy the last football game of the year, the Super Bowl, in a couple weeks. And we will catch you here a little later.